Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Over the past seven weeks, we've been looking at some of the attitudes that Jesus told his disciples to have for a blessed life, haven't we? And it's safe to say that there have been some surprises. We've seen how the kingdom of heaven uh, has turned the world's way of thinking on its head. But today's beatitude is perhaps the most upside down and the most challenging of them all. It's also probably the one that seems the most alien to us. Does this beatitude really make sense to the Christian life today? Well, as we dive into uh, this beatitude, uh, there are a couple of things that I think it's probably helpful to think of first. Well, firstly, we need to think of the global perspective. While we might be fairly free of persecution here in the UK, that's not the case across the world. We've already watched that video, haven't we, from Open Doors this evening. And they estimate that more than 340 million Christians across the world suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith. One in eight Christians. This comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from being beaten or imprisoned or killed, for converting to Christianity, or perhaps losing their jobs or not being considered for jobs, or being disowned by their communities. And coronavirus, like with lots of things, has exacerbated this problem as well. So uh, Islamic militants have taken advantage of the restrictions and taken ground in sub-Saharan Africa. That's had a big impact on Christians. And there have been many reports in poorer countries that Christians have had their ration cards torn up by community leaders or they've been denied aid in in other ways. And overall, Open Doors estimates that there's been an increase in in persecution of 19% in the last year. So from a global perspective, Jesus' words are as relevant today as they ever have been. You can find out more if you go to the Open Doors uh, World Watch List. Uh, You can find that online. But the second reason why Jesus' words really are as relevant today as they ever have been is because in the same way that we've approached all of the other sayings in this teaching, we believe that what Jesus says here is a spiritual reality that's applicable uh, for all times. In just the same way that those who mourn their sin or, or are merciful will be blessed, So there's a spiritual reality here that the world has always opposed God's ways. Before Jesus, the world persecuted God's people. Think of the prophets and Exodus. And after Jesus, the the world opposed Jesus' ways and his followers. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says to Timothy, a young pastor that he mentors, that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now you might ask, well, Paul, how can you make such a sweeping statement? But he understands that there's a tension between the message and the way of Jesus on the one hand and the mindset and the way of the world on the other, and that conflict is inevitable. Why is that? Well, the problem, the heart of the problem, is our hearts. When we're exposed to righteousness, we, when we see the God in the, in the words and actions of another person, there are often two very different responses. One response that we have is that we find it attractive, but the other is that we find it repulsive. And sometimes we might even feel a bit of a tug in two directions. But that's because the light of Jesus uncovers the darkness in our soul, and sometimes our response is to long for more of it. But other times our response is to get away from it because it exposes us, our ugliness, and it condemns our love of things that are unrighteous. Take Luke chapter 16, verse 13 as an example. Turn to it if you've got a Bible. Here Jesus says, No servant can can serve two masters. Either he'll, he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And two weeks ago, Gareth spoke on being pure in heart, if you remember. And that's exactly what Jesus is addressing here. He says, there's a problem. You can't go, on the one hand, every part of my life is yours, God. 
but then also make the goal of your life financial security or, or success. The two aren't compatible. But listen to the reaction that Jesus receives from the Pharisees in the next verse. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. So in response to Jesus' statement, the Pharisees engage in a form of persecution by sneering. How ridiculous. What an extreme view. This man from Nazareth doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know what they said. But Jesus' purity and his condemnation of their impurity is repulsive to the Pharisees. And at first, he's not even directly challenging them specifically, or he doesn't seem to. But their response of persecution is a reaction to justify their love of unrighteousness. And that's so often what we do. The experience uh, that Jesus had here, and perhaps you can think of instances in your own life too, it leads us to the conclusion that when we live out the Beatitudes, we should expect opposition. If the natural outworking of the good news in a person's life will lead them to having attitudes like being merciful or being a peacemaker, well, by including this last statement with the rest, Jesus is showing us that it's actually normal, even expected, that a Christian will experience persecution for living out these Beatitudes. That's why throughout the Bible the righteous continuously come up against opposition. Those who have chosen to live by God's way clash with those who have rejected his ways. And here in verse 12 of Matthew 5, Jesus he relates his disciples to the prophets of the Old Testament. He says, in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. Now the, the, uh, the prophets that uh, we read about in the Old Testament, they were often persecuted for uh, sticking their heads above the parapet uh, and calling kings and rulers and, and others to righteousness. Some of them were successful. Uh, you can think of Nathan, who uh, called King David out on his adultery with Bathsheba. But many of them fell on deaf ears. Many were tortured or killed. Elijah's the most famous uh, prophet who spent much of his life in hiding. And John the Baptist was the last figure like this who lost his head after challenging King Herod uh, when he married his brother's wife. Righteousness attracts opposition. Righteousness attracts persecution. But if we walk humbly with God, we closely examine our hearts, we act with, with gentleness even in the face of ridicule, we expose the evil of pride in the world. If we speak with compassion, then we expose callousness in other people's hearts. If we take purity seriously, then our love of God will be an affront to those who love money, or those who misuse sex, or, or those who abuse power. If we're open and honest and thorough in our work and all of our different dealings, then we'll show up laziness and negligence. If we pursue peace, then we're likely to encounter indifference and even hostility towards our peacemaking. One of my greatest heroes uh, is German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He came from a fairly uh, wealthy middle-class family, d descended from minor nobility, and um, you know, he was well connected amongst the elite in German society. Uh, and he was a rising star in the world of academics. People watched with excitement at where his life might lead him. But something that you ought to know about Bonhoeffer is that he was deeply challenged and inspired by the upside-down life that Jesus calls his disciples to in the Sermon on the Mount. And so when the Nazi party took power in Germany, Bonhoeffer spoke out directly against Hitler's leadership, against his discrimination uh, of Jews, and his declaring himself the head of the church. 
many Christians, uh, even pastors, were uh, either intimida intimidated uh, into giving their allegiance to him or, or even won over. But Bonhoeffer refused consistently and repeatedly. Uh, and in the following years, it cost him much. It cost him everything, in fact. His authorization to teach at Berlin Re University was revoked. He had to regularly report to the police. He would uh, go on uh, to be forbidden to speak at all in public or publish his work. But he continued on and on, uh, joining the German resistance even. And uh, he spent his last couple of years in prison. And in the end, uh, he was executed just a couple of weeks before the end of the war, aged 39, along with a bunch of other important prisoners, in a last-ditch attempt by some of the senior officials to cover up their crimes. Such an undignified end for him. He gave up so much and yet was swept away so ungloriously. The same goes for John the Baptist, who had such a great uh, ministry, but was beheaded on a whim by, the King, by King Herod because he had promised his daughter anything for a dance. The path of righteousness cost them both greatly. And you might think, well, we live a world away from the, uh, the Bonhoeffer and John the Baptist that we see here. But things have changed for us here in the UK even in the last few years. In, in many ways, it is more difficult to be a Christian. We hear of people being sacked or disciplined for offering to pray with patients or clients or colleagues. Of a foster carer struck off for allowing a Muslim girl in her care to become a Christian. We live in an individualistic society where it's offensive to make a claim uh, that authority on issues of morality can be anything but personal choice. It said, well, if it doesn't hurt me or anyone else, how can it be wrong? How can you tell me what to do? And persecution is a strong word to use. But when Annie and I were f first started dating, if we talked to some of our non-Christian friends uh, about not sleeping together or, or living together until we got married, there were undertones, sometimes less uh, more obvious than undertones, uh, that clearly implied that they thought we were a bit stupid or, or naive, or that we were kind of keeping up this facade and we actually um, were lying about it. But you know, either way, we'd probably end up with a bit of a car crash because uh, we didn't know each other well enough. We were either, either silly and un unenlightened or just plain lying about what happened behind closed doors. And for us Christians in the UK, that, that can often be the way that we experience opposition on a day-to-day -day basis, a low-level undermining that subtly opposes, that doesn't take us seriously, thinks we're old-fashioned or misguided or hypocritical. Sometimes those things do erupt into a more overt opposition when we particularly take a stand against the culture. But this last beatitude of Jesus shows us that living the righteous life will be costly because righteousness attracts opposition and we should expect it if that's how we're living. But we also see in these verses that, that Jesus' message brings comfort. Bonhoeffer's alleged last words uh, were noted down by one of the prison doctors. This is what he said, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. In his final moments, he had the promise that Jesus made to those who are persecuted in mind. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For those who receive persecution, we have a message of comfort because we'll receive an eternal reward. Those people have forsaken earthly treasures, be that wealth or status or other indulgences, but they've not done so in vain because they'll receive an, a heavenly treasure, the kind of treasure that doesn't spoil or fade. And knowing that we have a priceless treasure in heaven that the kingdom of heaven is our inheritance, it means that we can keep on going, even through the most difficult 
persecution and, and it will make us stronger. The upside down reality is that more people become Christians and more people become stronger Christians, they grow in their faith when they are most hard pressed. Here's a quick snippet from an Open Doors video. Um, it's an interview with Pastor Marcus from Nigeria and he lives in a place where uh, today he and his church members are persecuted by uh, mostly the Islamic extremist Boko Haram. Although the persecution has been severe, Pastor Marcus believes that it has led to the spread of the gospel. This persecution has become like a fertilizer for the gospel. Our church had only 200 members before Boko Haram came, but now we have 300 to 400 members. Before, we were weak, but after this, we have become very strong in the faith. We do not pray that God will take away the hardship, but that God should give us the grace to be able to stand. The Bible tells us that whoever endures until the end will receive a crown of righteousness. This is the message I want to send to Christians today. Do not be afraid. Do not let your guard down, because hope is coming to us. Since our Master Jesus went through this suffering, we also, who have become his followers, will go through it. But in the end, we will be victorious. So as we come into land, we might ask the question, how should we respond when we receive opposition or persecution for our faith, for righteousness? What's the be attitude that we should have here? Well, Jesus' call to meekness shows that we should respond with gentleness and humility, not revenge. Uh, but equally, we don't need to sulk or take ourselves off to lick our wounds in self-pity, or grin and bear it as if it doesn't affect us. Actually, when we are passionate about Jesus, we can, as he says in verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Why? Well, for, there's, there are several reasons. Uh, firstly, because we have the inheritance of heaven to cling on to, and that's far greater than any earthly treasure we give up or any price that we pay for it. And secondly, uh, because like the prophets before us, when we're persecuted because of our righteousness, it shows us the genuineness of our discipleship. We join a long line of witnesses uh, to Jesus who have suffered for him. But most of all, when we're passionate about Jesus, we can rejoice in our suffering for him because we're doing it for him, the one that we love, the one who we long to be like. It, it reminds us of the fact that it was precisely Jesus' righteousness that led the, the religious leaders to plot against him and crucify him. It was his righteousness that exposed their ugliness, their love of the unrighteous. Yet he still endured their insults, their abuse. He, the one that made the stars, lowered himself to be like us, to endure our ridicule, ridicule to suffer by our hands so that we might have life through him. It was that suffering of his that made the way for us to be sons and daughters, to have our heavenly reward, all because of his great love for us. So we can be confident, and as Jesus says in the, in the very next verses, he talks about a lamp and not needing to hide it, but we can put it on a stand for everyone to see. When we suffer, even in the smallest way for our faith, we can rejoice because we're like him and we can pray that our righteousness might cause others to look to him it's about as upside down as you can get but it makes perfect sense to jesus's disciples in acts chapter 5 uh, the apostles are persecuted by the religious leaders in jerusalem after they've been performing all kinds of uh, signs and miracles and, and teaching and here's what happens the religious leaders called the apostles in and had them flogged. 
Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. So what can we expect from this beatitude? Well, we should expect opposition when we put our light on its stand before everyone. Some people will be attracted by it, others will be repulsed. But we can be comforted by the promise of the kingdom of heaven as the reward for suffering for Jesus. And when we love Jesus, we can rejoice in our suffering for him because it reminds us of what he went through for us. We shouldn't seek out persecution, but we should go looking for opportunities to live out these beatitudes. And sooner or, late, sooner, sooner or later, uh, the reality is opposition will find us, persecution will find us. But however large or small, we can rejoice knowing that we do it for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you first of all for your example of righteousness. We thank you for your light which exposes our love of unrighteousness. And we re pray that you'd reveal those things to us that we might be like you and, and show the world what you're like. But most of all, we thank you that you suffered for us, that you first were persecuted for us, that we might have life and know you.